whatever reasons to have access to it. So welcome class to anyone who's tuning in now or later. We're just going full screen here. All right. This is lesson 15, if you can believe it. We have been gathering for 15 weeks and we have five more lessons to complete the series. Now we are, oh, and let me get it going on my Edge Creations recording back here. Exciting things are happening now in this class because having learned the basic concepts, it is now possible to actually begin to apply those concepts to your day-to-day -day and moment-to-moment -moment experience of reality. So lesson 14 was all about ascension and lesson 15 is about intentional use of energy and the solar partnership and kundalini and this whole topic is all connected. Everything about it is basically like saying, you know, here in this picture back behind me, you can see that there is a human form. It has two arms and two legs and one head. And then you can also see that there is a interpenetrating chakra field of energy all surrounding this body and through it and inside of it. And this field is a living conscious entity or rather it is comprised of a group of many living conscious entities in exactly the same way that your physical body is made up of tons of tiny, 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 tiny little cells. Amazing, amazing to understand that. And every cell has its own birth and lifespan and death and its own sense of epic drama and importance of who that cell is in your totality of experience. And also, at the same time that the little tiny cell is having its little tiny microcosmic experience, you're having your macrocosmic experience. Same thing with the physical and the non-physical. We have a physical portion of our self, of our being, and then we have a non-physical portion of our self. And the non-physical portion of our self, hello Noel, good to see you, thank you for tuning in. We're doing conscious manifestation. And a lot of this topic of conscious manifestation has to do with defining who you are, what is self, what is identity, like what do you identify with, and kind of cosmic ethics. Because, you know, I do not have the cosmic ethics to reach into someone else's life and change it, even to make improvements. Like, much as I would like to, I recognize that it is totally unwise and totally inappropriate for little old me to reach into, let's say, Noel's brain and his mind and be like, oh, let me just massage your brain a little bit and then it won't hurt at all. You'll be much better in the morning. Like that is totally beyond any kind of boundary for me to do that. Hello, Ed. Thank you for joining us. Of course. Yeah, if I'm here with Lisa and Mike is if what he is, isn't here, it'll be very soon. Yes, Mike is showing up from his location. Hello, Lisa, okay. good to see you. So we're, we're talking about the partnership between the physical self and the non-physical self, or the field that surrounds each one of us, the chakras on the body, the portion of your anatomy that is not physical in its nature. And in exactly the same way that we have a physical body that's made up of little tiny individual cells that make up our totality, we also have this complex energy field. And the field is comprised of many different layers of consciousness. So now we're getting into the sophisticated understanding of nested consciousness and emanations of the primary source or the primary ray of consciousness and light on its journey that we are all, including this light body that is filled with chakras, we are all light on its journey or consciousness on its journey, but we are not equivalent. Some aspects of light have been traveling more than others. They have had more experiences. They have been further refined and further honed or sharpened in their existence. So just as I said earlier, I would not presume to reach into someone else's brain and you know monkey around and massage and change things. What I'm really trying to say is that I've had the experience and I've learned and I recognize that there is not wisdom in behaving in that way. That with the refinement process of experience, the refinement process of moving through time, literally one is learning 
you learn what functions, you learn what works, and learn what is ineffectual. And it is highly ineffectual and against interdimensional ethics to just reach into someone else's mind and make changes, or just reach into someone else's life and make changes. Also, this comes down to, hey, I'm Aurora, I'm a walk-in. I didn't used to live in a body. I used to be without a body, and I was consciousness on its journey in a different form. Why in the world did I go through all the difficulty of actually getting a body and coming down here? Why didn't I just sit on a cloud from the hyperspace realm, wave my magic wand, and poof, make everything better? And the answer is that it is not possible to make the same amount of changes or have the same impact from the hyperspace or less dense realms than it is to be submerged in this level of density. Let's define density, because I was having this conversation with Mike earlier today. When I'm talking about density, I'm literally referring to like the physical matter and molecules of the universe. That if there's a lot of molecules squished into a one little place, you have solid. And if the molecules get spread out a little bit more, it's liquid. And if it gets spread out a lot more, then it's gaseous. And so we are describing the amount of energy that is squished into one little place. So I've got a couple of different things here. We're going to talk about the Bose-Einstein condensate and the eventual fate of the universe. And we're going to talk about duality and really resolving the push and pull between light and dark, forces of light and forces of dark. But right now we're working on this concept of the energy body and divine co-creative partnership. Because these energy beings, literally, the chakras on your body are literally energy beings. So in order for these energy beings to live, it requires an organic substrate, a body, physical body. I was speaking about in earlier lessons that when you die and they autopsy your body, they can cut open your brain and see an actual physical pineal gland. So science is able to say, oh, I see something is there. But when a person dies, you don't have energy centers anymore. All of these energy centers, like the spinning energy center up here, it dissipates when you die. It's like the flow of blood and it's like the emanations of your brain that might be measured in an EEG. These aspects of life go away when you die. And so there's been a barrier to understanding and accepting these aspects of non-physical reality because science has difficulty perceiving them. So okay, that's part of it. And part of it is that each one of these chakras is like an organ or an energy center on your body and it has a consciousness it has its own personal life journey and agenda and it's not only centered in you so i've spoken about this before universal christ consciousness we each have a third eye an indigo chakra up here and indigo is associated with christ consciousness not the Christian religion at all, and we'll get into this too, because really the Christian religion, as it has been taught on earth for the past approximately 2,000 years, is antithetical to the functioning of this uh, seat of consciousness to your pineal gland and to the proper functioning of your um, insight and the, the things that you use this chakra for. So when I say teachings of the church are antithetical, what do I mean? Basically, the church teaches things about sin. These are basic premises in the church's doctrine, that there is such a thing as sin, that you carry it within you, that certain parts of your body, certain body parts, according to the church, are more sinful than others. Like, oh, whatever you do, don't touch those sinful earlobes. Like how ridiculous that sounds, right? But there are body parts where the church teaches, whatever you do, don't touch those body parts, they are sinful. You know something, that takes you away. Well, teaching that there's something wrong with touching the genitals literally takes energy away from the red chakra. And the red chakra is the base, and that is the beginning of cultivating kundalini. In kundalini, when you begin to cultivate that energy and have it um, arise up the spine, gives wonderful, 
um, blissful and ecstatic feelings that are very similar to sexual um, stimulation and gratification. So we have the teachings of the church that basically say, if you feel these feelings, you're doing something wrong. Whatever you do, don't feel these feelings. When those feelings are the direct precursors to awakening your third eye. It's, this is that simple. The Christian church and the Christian doctrine has been used as a one of the bars on your mental cage. And even if you yourself are not a Christian, you say, oh, ha, I am not a Christian. I don't believe in any of that claptrap. You exist submerged within this time and place. You are marinating in this Judeo-Christian culture. And even though you might not specifically be embracing patriarchal or twisted Christian um, values that are not about true Christ at all, you might be affected by them. And even the Christ chakra up here has been a little bit tainted or negatively affected by the patriarchal programming and duality of the time in which we find ourselves. Duality is a very good segue into the Bose-Einstein condensate, so we're gonna loop around to that because we use the flying rainbow lasagna, flying rainbow lasagna to resolve duality. And what's going on at this level of the chakra has everything to do with the entity that is Christ exploring its own inner duality. This might be hard to understand because literally we have deified Christ. The problem with this is that Christ is an entity. It's like, oh, I mean, I'm trying to think of the most absurd thing possible, but it's just a very, very, very large person. Christ is a very, very big, large person, not a perfect person. This must be understood. So first of all, Christ doesn't necessarily have a body like you and I, doesn't necessarily have two eyes and a nose and a mouth and earlobes and shoulders, but we all embody Christ. So Christ does have all of those body parts through us, but Christ consciousness is such an overarching large entity that we would not necessarily say that it is housed in a physical structure other than the, the structure of every single molecule and every single living being that exists within this universe. Mike asks for clarity. We are a fragment of Christ? Big fat yes on that. We are absolutely a fragment of Christ. In fact, if I might use an analogy, but not to be taken too literally, but to be understood kind of literally, Christ is still on the cross. Or Jesus, or Yeshua, the person who was the avatar of Christ consciousness 2,000 years ago, who was tortured, he is still in the midst of that torture. He is still at that final moment of death and release. And what you do not understand, but what I do understand from my direct experience is that your final moment can stretch to encompass as much as you need to learn in order to come to closure and release. So there's a couple of things here. First of all, Christ consciousness coming into an avatar's body. Christ consciousness, the universal consciousness, decided 2,000 years ago, wait, humanity needs guidance. I'm gonna go down there and say something. That desire itself shows that there is not total perfection. I am not casting aspersions here. I am not saying, nanny, nanny, poo, poo, you're not perfect. Far from it, far from it. That's looking at things in a very third dimensional or dualistic or human based viewpoint. And really the idea is that if you do not know everything, you have something to learn, you have something to explore. You have an aspect of consciousness that has yet to be fully refined. You can test whether you have an aspect of consciousness that still needs to be refined by whether you have any interest in doing or accomplishing anything or effort in any way. It took effort for Christ consciousness to actually occupy a body and come here and flap its mouth parts and try to talk to people and make efforts. Like, first of all, it represents attachments. The overarching Christ consciousness had attachments. It had desires. It had an agenda. It had all sorts of things that it wanted to accomplish, and it didn't know the outcome. So it had to get into the river of time, be submerged in the third dimension, and have this experience of being in the fourth dimension, and go through all of the experiences. And basically, um, 
every single historical event since the year 2000, since the year zero, has all been inside of the dream of the mind of Jesus Christ. He is exploring his own inner aspects of self, which each and every one of us are his inner aspects of self. So have been every single historical figure since that time. Hard to imagine, but think about this. When you go to sleep at night, you close your eyes, you have a dream. You have an inner realm that is entirely populated by characters that are aspects of you. It's you. When you dream of a really, really nice, benevolent person, you're dreaming of an inner aspect of the self. And when you're dreaming of a horrible nightmare, you know, killer who wants to, you know, stab you or something like that, you are also dreaming of aspects of self. Now we're getting into light and shadow, Christ and antichrist, because Christ, universal Christ, is the power of awareness. It is literally light. It's like saying understanding. It's like saying, uh, I didn't understand until I turned on the light and then I understood because light gave me information. And knocking out duality has everything to do with understanding that light and dark are two aspects of exactly the same consciousness. We are experiencing a spectrum of consciousness and it has been arbitrarily divided into two levels of having this much information versus having this much information. And the truth or factual description of the universe is that every being has some aspect of things that they know about and then some portion of their being that they don't know about. And the whole journey that we are here experiencing is learning about the stuff, the fraction that we don't know about. So Christ consciousness, even at the size of a galactic entity, there's stuff that it doesn't know about. Why am I bringing this up so pointedly? And the answer is because people have deified Christ consciousness. They have described and defined it as a perfect individual who knows everything, who is infallible. And those three things are not factual when describing Christ consciousness. I am not bad-mouthing Christ or saying that Christ isn't valuable or isn't good, but I am saying that Christ had a, a motivation to become human and have human experiences, and Christ is still here living through each one of us. We make up the mosaic of totality. If this were a perfected being, this being would not have the need to have any more experiences. This is what it's all about. Like, when you're done, you're done. Like, you get to press save on the file of who you are and do not have to edit that file any further. You don't need any further refinements. I mean, it's hard to believe, but that is the point. That's where we're all going. When we actually get there, then you'll say, oh, I wish there was more to do. Like, this is what happens, that beings get to that level of perfection and refinement of consciousness, and then they're like, oh, but wait, like, now it's not that interesting anymore. So, first of all, being submerged in the third dimension and having a physical body is a totally wonderful privilege and not something to be looked down upon for. Many people feel that they are less good than a hyperspace being. And I mentioned Flatland on my radio show on Sunday morning, and I'm going to mention it in here again, and I think I might have shared the link. It is available on YouTube. I really enjoy this movie. It's like an animated, pretty short movie, about the viewpoint of a bunch of beings that live on a flat, two-dimensional plane. And everything that they see, they only see this edge of the plane, right? And one day, one of these occupants of the flat zone meets a sphere that is physical and circular, and it wants to worship the sphere. It's like, oh, oh my god, I've never seen anything like you. And the sphere says, please do not worship me. I'm simply from a higher dimensional space. And that gives me greater degrees of freedom, greater perspective, greater understanding. But I am not better than you in any way. 
that's beautiful and that's worth watching the movie just for that scene in the movie apply it to your own existence we must all apply it to our own existences because too many times have humanity or has humanity as the kindergartner on the playground of hyperspace beings been fooled or had one put over on humanity saying ah oh, yeah you should give over your power to these guys they are really high up they're really perfect and then finding out that you just gave all your lunch money to a bunch of first graders that they're not really that much more advanced than you are that they are only slightly superior in their position to you and that they are using that superior position to even take advantage of you a little bit so this has happened many times in Earth's past where hyperdimensional, higher dimensional beings showed themselves to hum humans who were submerged in density and did not have perspective and they were easily mistaken for, you know, godlike beings. But their behaviors were, um, gave evidence of their lack of refinement. When I say that, I'm referring to like, let's talk about the Greek gods as an example. Like you read the Greek myths and it sounds like, it sounds like teenagers. They're so poorly behaved. So-and-so is always fighting with so-and-so. So-and-so is sleeping with so-and-so. Like to me, this is not godly behavior. It's very petty. It's very puerile or childish or unevolved. It's pretty much just like humans, but with a longer lifespan and greater power, you know? So, you know, if you're a human and someone makes you mad, I will throw my spear at you. But if I'm a god and you make me mad, I'm going to hurl a thunderbolt at you. Like, to me, that level of godliness is not very godly like it would be much more godly to be like ah if you do something that i don't approve of i will hurl a thunderbolt of transformative love at you and that will cause some form of you know inner revolution that will change your life um anyway 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 um, so the higher dimensional beings have an expanded perspective compared to your own perspective, but there are many things that they lack. And this is why there is this partnership. So I want to right now empower you who are listening and anybody who watches this recording because I do not want you to be exploited or taken advantage of by older kids on the playground who come along and say, we're extra dimensional beings. We've got it all under control. Give over all of your free will to us, listen to us, give us all of your creative power and juices, and um, you know, then you'll be lucky to be a part of our utopian grander reality. Like that is not what benevolent hyperspace beings would act like. That is what exploiters and usurpers would act like. So to give an example, like if I were a hyperspace being and I revealed myself to earthly beings, I wouldn't be like, fantastic, time to start the rainbow r lasagna religion. Like, no, 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 no. Like real um, loving entities do not want slaves. They don't want slaves. Not only are slaves just so much bother and so much trouble because it is constantly necessary to monitor them and tell them what to do and tell them what not to do, but also get a lot more out of your money or a lot, uh, you get a lot more bang for your buck if a person is independent and not enslaved. That literally you will get more thought, better thought, better performance, and better innovation when a person is not enslaved. Like you're not gonna get beautiful sonatas written or beautiful paintings created or um, medical ways of healing people uh, created, you know, new, new ways innovated. You're not going to get that when people are enslaved. Um, being enslaved is all about losing your personal power uh, giving up your divine freedom, your birthright of your divine freedom, and um, giving uh, an external authority figure the power of your own will. So despite the fact that that is a normal, quote unquote, thing to do in this time and place, I am heartily recommending against you doing it with your interactions with hyperspace beings. 
First of all, hyperspace beings aren't better than you or me or anyone. They simply exist in a super imposed position. They are simply, instead of standing on the floor, they're standing on the ledge up here, or they're hanging from the ceiling up here. It does not necessarily mean that they are better morally or ethically or more loving. So it's very, very important to be discerning in the people that you choose to interact with. So my litmus test for interacting with anyone, if they are corporeal or non-corporeal, is that they have to be uh, an unconditionally loving being. So I do not accept rude behavior, um, uh, insulting language, demeaning language from anyone in my life, not from a person that I would live with in a physical house and not a person that I would share a physical body with in terms of consciousness and manifestation. Um, and also any being that has to feels the need to control you as the temporal ego self through insults is just a weak being. And truly powerful higher dimensional beings do not need to control other little lower dimensional beings and definitely not through what we would deem really abuse. Through cutting you down, making mean comments, implying that you're not good enough, and, uh, filling you with doubt, and then saying, and all you need to do in order to get out of all of that doubt is please me. Like this is the whole idea that you develop a sense that you have to please mommy or daddy or teacher or grandmother or Obama or Jesus and that no matter what your activities are, it is only when you get that seal of approval, you know, like you've been approved, that then you're okay. It is totally, it has never really been appropriate to act in that way, only in like touch the stove and find out that it's hot. Touch the stove and find out that that way of working doesn't work. It's being totally controlled and manipulated. It's like saying, I've got huge handles, please grab onto them and swing me around and I'll do whatever you want. This is now a time of sovereignty. This is now the time when you get to say, I have awoken to my true nature and I know what I truly deserve and I do not wish to be engaged in a spiritual partnership that is demeaning at all. And I do not mean to be offensive to any established Christians or beings who attend a church or establish religion here, but when I look at the way that the Christian religion treats people, I find it demeaning. Like, no, you should not soldier forward. Please do not soldier forward. First of all, I do not agree with the use of military language or militarizing spiritual and personal growth. The whole idea of um, characterizing this experience of personal growth as a war, a battle between good and evil, is so ineffective that, I mean, clearly this is why I've recorded two radio programs and I'm here speaking about this on the video conference today. This is about being mired in duality, letting the loud thing go by on the street outside. Being mired in duality, being stuck on the good versus evil paradigm. Hey, it's nice to be mired in that duality because I can always be like, hey, I'm good and you are evil. I love to point the finger. And it's so nice when you could put yourself up on a pedestal. I'll divide the world into two easy categories, one of which is extremely flattering, one of which is extremely unflattering, and I'll put myself in the flattering category, right? This sounds perfect. This is what everybody does. And also be cautious because even if you are not trained as a judgmental Christian, Many people who are light workers or new age workers or people who are, um, let's say, embracing the change and shift in consciousness are people who are still working with this um, patriarchal paradigm, really, of um, an us versus them mentality and the sense that something needs to be overpowered and controlled. And um, so this is, you know, there's lots of questions here, the kind of like, um, if Jesus is so powerful, how come we've had such a bad 2,000 years? And then the answer is always, well, that's because the Antichrist has been intervening. But when we're saying that, what we're really saying is, and I'm going to uh, pause the edge creations in the background, what we're really saying is, sorry, here we go, saving it super fast. We're saying that Christ,
Sorry about that, guys. Just trying to get it so that you can see things a little bit better. And waiting until I get this thing cycled through again. It's kind of like, have you considered why the God of the Bible and some of the actions of the God of the Bible just seems so very unevolved and it seems so unflattering and non-higher dimensional. The idea that I, uh, I as God, I as Jehovah, could be um, displeased by something so petty that I would then decide to kill you. You know, I mean, what, what parent in any realm could be so displeased that they could kill their child? And yet this is what the God of the Bible is described as, a God or a creator or a parent that is so uh, displeased with its own creation that it decides it, at various times to either sacrifice the creation or flood it or, you know, rain fire and brimstone upon it. Like, none of that to me sounds like a highly evolved creature or even like a kind toddler. Like I know toddlers that act in a better way than that. So right now what we're talking about is characterizing good and evil and duality and the duality that many light workers or new age consciousness workers are falling into in the sense of expecting that, that there's going to be a dark side that you're fighting against. You know something? Stop thinking of it in that way. It doesn't have to be a constant struggle against the dark side. When I turn on the light switch in this room, I'm not like, I'm fighting against you, darkness and shadows. You're going down. I'm more like, wow, I'm turning on the light so I can see and perform my daily tasks. This is what this is all about. When I go into my studio during the day, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to rock it out. I'm going to paint a painting. I'm going to sing. I'm going to do music. I'm going to be in joy. I'm not saying like, I'm now going to go and fight demons and you're going down demons. Like, no, but that is the unintended byproduct of me accessing my joy. And certainly in my experience and my incarnation here, I've had the um, times when I have just been fighting against demons, fighting against evil. And I realized, I really learned that all of that pulling and pushing and pulling and pushing, that it was just maintaining the status quo. The struggle itself was maintaining the status quo, okay? And I am flying rainbow lasagna, and I could, I, I'll, could pull one up on the image on behind me if I take the time to do it. Um, this is all about resolving duality. So let's take a little trip into the universe at the end of the world. Right now, stars are being born. This means that there's enough raw materials in the universe in terms of clouds of dust and gas to coalesce into nebulas and eventually coalesce into stars and become stellar consciousnesses that have a whole lifespan and then eventually die. And when they die, they backflip into themselves and create their own reality and return to the source. They create a big giant, a black hole, a portal of consciousness to another realm and they go there, okay? Just like we will travel also. When, and this is billions of years in the future, at a certain point, all of the stars have been made and there's no more raw materials for more stars to be made. Science describes this as the end of the era of birthing stars. So according to the universe life cycle, life cycle of the entity of our entire universe, at a certain point, it's just like a female's fertility goes down and she cannot have children anymore, at a certain point, the stars will not be born anymore. And then all the stars that are currently in existence will grow old and die. And you'll be left with a whole realm that is kind of like Swiss cheese, except the holes are black holes. And all energy and warmth and light is going to exit through those black holes. It's kind of like saying, strike the set. This play is over. There's no new characters that are coming. There's no more energy to work with. We are wrapping this sucker up and everybody's going home. And that's what all of the black holes are. They're all doorways to infinity or doorways of consciousness that all lead back to the source. 
And this has everything to do with states of matter. Because what will be left behind will be just the husk of matter. So like we've talked about this with food. When you <laughs> eat food, you have light in the matter and your body refines out the light, turns it into cognition, ideas and perception and neural, neural stimulation. It turns it into heat. And the husk, the empty now container for consciousness that was the food, exits your body. The husk, just inert matter. Well, at a certain point, the refinery of the universe will refine out all consciousness from this universe and you will be left with nothing more than the empty husk of molecules. And Bose-Einstein condensate is what happens to matter when it is brought down to only a tiny fraction of a degree above zero degrees Kelvin. So zero degrees Kelvin, this is absolute zero. This would be like saying the total lack of energy. No light, no heat, no energy, no movement. A totally cold, still, frozen universe. That's what is going to happen at the end of this cycle of refinement of this realm where consciousness and light and awareness is cycled out of this realm and all that is left is darkness. So many people, if they think about that, they think, oh, that sounds terrible, just a realm of pure darkness, it's a hellish realm. What you do not understand is that at that level of coldness, the, molecule, the atomic activity inside of all of those molecules slows down. Instead of the little electrons bouncing around, having lots of momentum, there's almost no movement. And instead of the atoms acting as individual atoms, they start to smear together and create kind of like an overarching unity atom. And it starts to act as one being. So if you are ever speaking with a scientific, rational, objective materialist about um, unity consciousness, you can talk about a Bose-Einstein condensate and what happens when matter gets to that level of density. Because basically, oh, I have to bring up a picture of the flying rainbow lasagna in order to um, properly do this. Just scrolling to find one. That's right. Here we go. Oh, perfect. And back to recording. Um, the flying rainbow lasagna has over here, uh, I'm moving it so you can see it better. Over here, this up at the top, let's just arbitrarily define that as the place of total energy, total presence of all energy and consciousness. And let's make this one down here the total lack of all energy, total lack of consciousness. And that we are experiencing the divine oscillation between these two seeming opposites. So when you make an object, any kind of object, in order to have a solidified object, this is made of light, or you and me were made of light, it means that we have waylaid light on its journey. Light is emitted from the surface of the sun or any star. And if it is not interacted with, it's moving through space, it's a beautiful frictionless environment, that light would go on forever. That's an incredible, an incredible journey. There's literally light that has been on this endless journey of consciousness and it would simply continue onward forever if it never met a solid object. If that light meets a solid object, it can bounce off of it, like there's light bouncing off of my face so that you can see my face. Or if that light actually enters into the aperture of my eyeball, then it gets caught inside of me. That literally, we live on a planet and light has been caught on this planet, on every planet. <coughs> light has been slowed down from its ordinary speed, light speed, 186,000 miles per second, and it now is solidified. So drawing this on the screen behind me, if this is light on its journey, like here's a wave of light going on its journey, and now let's say that it has reached this big black dot, which is you know a planet or a piece of matter or my face. There you go, reached the big black dot back there. 
What that means is that everything in this direction doesn't exist. That whole part, that, that little molecule of light would have continued onward and onward and onward and onward and onward, but instead it was stopped on its journey. And so what that means is that there is a shadow. Light, in order to make the physical realm, has been coalesced, and it has been slowed down and waylaid on its journey. And that means that there is literally a shadow. And my face is perfect because here in this room there's some shadows underneath my neck, shadows on this side, shadows over here. Shadows help us to perceive reality as a third dimensional place. If we look at a drawing that is made without shadows, we call it a line drawing. And it does not look like it is made of curved surfaces. It's not an illusion that looks like a real object. It's more like a simplification or a shorthand. Shadow is necessary in order to give depth or to render a, um, a object that looks like it's actually in reality. OK, so now we have everything to do with why does darkness exist? We have light, which is the force of awareness, and then we have darkness, which is the force of anti-awareness or lack of awareness. So first of all, when we're talking about our chakras, we're also talking about light beings, and we are talking about, oh, I'm trying to make this smaller. We're talking about light beings, and I'm um, just moving this so that we can see it a little better. Here we go. light beings and um, areas of lack of awareness, that even beings of light can have areas of lack of awareness. And this is what we are talking about when I'm talking about that it is inappropriate or ineffectual to worship or deify Christ consciousness. Christ consciousness has areas that are lack of awareness. Kind of amazing, because the programming is that Christ and Jesus are perfect, they know everything, and the sense that everything is already written in stone, everything, no, 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 no. Because also I think I've been talking a lot about higher dimensional realities as being uncollapsed waveforms and places of possibilities and probabilities, and um, new things have the capacity to be created. This is what the flying rainbow lasagna is all about, and this is also, I'll use the rest of this recording to talk about that, the amazing part of who you are. So basically, a lot of aspersions have been cast on humanity, or humanity has been sent, uh, described as diminished and less special than hyperspace, higher reality beings. In many ways, that sense of disempowerment is false, because humans or third dimensional beings have an incredible amount of creative energy at their, uh, at their disposal or at their, at their capacity to use. Um, hyperspace beings that are not submerged in the flow of time don't have that same capacity for creativity. It's like this, if you live in hyperspace, you live in the realm of a place where everything has already been figured out. All decisions have been made. All decisions are final. All books have been written, all songs have been written, all paintings have been painted. Everything is done. There is nothing more to create and nothing new to experience. In order to create something new, in order to have a new experience, it is necessary to submerge, to get into the flow of time and to be down here. Otherwise, Christ consciousness would not have had to get an avatar container to come here and be powerful and have an impact on humanity or on Earth's surface culture. I would not have had to come here and get you know, the use of a physical form in order to be able to come here. All of our beautiful angelic guides that are all around you know, each one of us um, would be simply uh, you know, totally powerful and have the capacity to make anything that they need to have happen. So what I'm trying to say is that the artificial separation between higher self and lower self has been disempowering to both sides, both to the uh, corporeal or lower de or, or denser self and the higher, less dense self. The less dense self wants to be active, wants to have an impact, wants to speak and be heard and act and be perceived and have things happen. The higher self for many thousands of years has been 
um, like relegated to the back of the closet, like, you know, like not really listened to and doesn't enjoy that. But what I'm trying to do is um, speak clearly to members of this class so that you are not taken advantage of. I do not want you to feel diminished or less valuable or less special than any higher space being. You know, just because, okay, Noel has a comment to share. There would be no point in being born if we were totally perfect and knew everything. Our presence here feeds the growth of consciousness for all dimensions. Here, here, that is apt, it's well spoken, it's totally accurate. This is the whole point. You can only be here in corporeal form if you have something to learn. If you didn't have something to learn, you wouldn't be able to be here. And I'm here, I have things to learn. So too is it with Christ consciousness. Christ consciousness is still learning. Oh, I can't even tell you this. What is the way that people learn, people are incarnated? Well, okay, I used to, or at one point, I slept in my car on Mount Overlook where there's a parking space that lots of people park up there and there's a nice place to view stars. And one night I perceived two people in the car next to me and they were making love. And I also perceived a lot of hyperspace beings that were fascinated. They were focused on the couple in the car next to me. And I understood from this perception that the way that conception happens is these spirit beings or hyperspace beings are drawn in and fascinated by the act of lovemaking. And if they really are interested enough, it's like they get sucked in and they actually become a part of the life that is made and actually become a part of that life experience. And it's just like if you're watching a movie or reading a book and you're reading and you're really getting into it and you really care about the characters and you really want to know what happens next. It's very much like that, but from the perspective of being a higher dimensional being. So, you know, what is the fascination? If you were a complete being, you would be sitting on a mountaintop not looking at a couple making love in their car. You wouldn't be interested. There wouldn't be anything to learn. So this is true of each one of us, especially as we begin to awaken the pineal gland, as we begin to open your third eye. It's kind of like, all right, I just perceive that guy's got a liver disease over there, or that guy's got that, or there's sexual abuse over there, or whatever I've just perceived. Why, why did I delve? Why was I interested? Why did I focus my eye on that topic or on that information? These are real questions and the, well, the answer is because I had something to learn from focusing my ideas or my energy or my perception there. So too does Christ consciousness have something to learn. And if you look at my lovely diagram over here, I'm making it so that you can see it hopefully a little bit better and move this aside. Here, okay, good. This, this area right here is where the indigo chakra, the one that is oriented in this direction, meets up with the violet chakra. And this is pretty important. This is what I'm talking about, the patriarchal programming of the Christian religion seeping into our understanding of the chakras. So this whole idea of Christ consciousness and we, Christ being called the Lord, and like you have to listen to the Lord as your external authority figure, and that if you don't, you're bad, clearly. This is like saying, listen to this chakra, listen to the chakra. Well, this chakra gives you a lot of information, but it is directed by this chakra that's up above this, this one up here, up above your head, this is the violet chakra, and it is at perpendicular angles to the Christ chakra. And that is what actually turns your inner eye and says, look over here, look over here, look over here. That is your innate divine connection to source. And that is what we each need to be cultivating. And you notice it is a level beyond Christ. Christ is not the end. Christ is not the end of the journey. The journey continues onward and it continues to the violet chakra. It is time for us to revise our understanding of Christ and to not fall into the traps of worship, of deification, of saying, you're better than me. Christ is not better than you. Christ is our equal partner. Let's be equal partners. So now let's talk about co-creating, all right? You are here in the physical realm, 
Christ is not yet here in the physical realm. We are partners and we are making that reality happen by being conduits of consciousness. But you are not less valuable than Christ. That means Christ does not get to say to you, hey, give up on who you are, give up on your own ideas and listen to me completely and do everything I tell you to do. No, that's not cool. I mean, whatever, whatever your dream of what your life should be, it is a valid dream and you have your own innate divine connection and it is not fair for some other entity to come along and say, you have to be something else completely other than what you are in order to be okay in my book. Like imagine if, you know, the Lord, quote unquote, came along and said, you're great, but in, for divine service, what I need you to do is give up on whatever matters to you. Like, you know, Noel, I know you make music. What if this entity said, what I need is for you to stop making music. Just ditch that silly ass thing completely. And what I want you to do is start making pies because people are hungry and they need pies. Like that is not a divine co-creative partnership at all. That is more like a dictator dictating your reality to you. So here, let, now let's model a different behavior between divine Christ consciousness and the temporal ego to say, Noel, I as higher consciousness wish to cultivate you into the greatest expression of your inner potential. And I would ask you, what do you need to make that a reality, to express your true inner potential? This is what smart bosses do. Smart bosses go to their employees and they don't tell them, you have to do your job like this. They say, what do you need to do your job better? All right. And temporal egos would say, oh, well, I need a new guitar or I need a better amp or I need uh, to be put in touch with a recording contract or I need, you know, um, fellow musicians to play with. Whatever are the things you would say. And so then your hyperspace self would, with the higher perspective, be able to look at the various timelines and say, ah, I see the amp that you want is on Craigslist on this timeline over here. Call this guy. You know, this is what divine co-creative partnership should be about. And I'm using that as, you know, kind of a silly and lighthearted example. But this is really important because we are all, as a society, becoming seamlessly integrated with our higher selves. And you must not be diminished your ego self must not be diminished or seen as less um, worthwhile or your desires less valid or in any way, um, you know, treated like a child or like a lower, less valuable aspect of self. No, no, you are valid and your desires are valid. And so this is, so I'm refining this. People can say many things. My desires as an ego, I want to drink seven beers a night. Like that's not necessarily a healthful, you know, project for you. This is not necessarily your life's avocation. That is more of a negative habit that you like to engage in. So you can see, I'm not talking about standing up for yourself in a petty way or defending your right to self-destruction or to bad behavior or, you know, poor behavior patterns in any way. I'm saying that you are the owner of your body and you are the owner and inhabitant of your life and you are absolutely it is appropriate for you to assert your desires and say this is what i want and to be receptive to the response of your divine co-creative partner because we're working within the parameters of reality even though we exist in this holodeck you know, in this period of grace, it's a, it's a totally fake simulacrum world, really. When you look around at all of this, this is all a construct, but it behooves us to take it seriously as if it is an actual world and to play along for a little while longer until all of the masks are taken off and all of the big reveals happen. And, you know, to take it, it, it Noel says, it is a very convincing illusion. It is a convincing illusion, but it is necessary to you know, remind yourself like this, the world that I am seeing around me is a construct and that these seemingly arbitrary rules are being upheld just in order to give us the opportunity to make a better system. So it's like this, if I were renovating a house before I tore out the old bathroom, I would build the new bathroom. Then I would feel totally fine with turning off the water for the old bathroom. Well, let's talk about the economy. 
We should not just dismantle the old economy without building a new economy. Build a new economy, then dismantle the old economy. Or how about your body? You know something? We're moving into a less dense realm. It is necessary to have a less dense body. You should build your less dense body and occupy it before you dismantle your physical, more dense body. You know, this is, this is what we're talking about is we are, every aspect of life is transitioning. The physical, cellular life of your body and all of the human cultural constructs that you experience in your human cellular body are all transforming. So some of we, I got just a few more moments on my recording on edge creations and then I'll open the floor to any questions or whatever. But the basic premise of what I've been speaking about, if you cannot tell, it mirrors my own inner experience and my own journey of consciousness, which is basically, you know, don't be a doormat to higher consciousness. Just because beings exist in a higher dimensional state does not mean that they know everything, that they're perfect. And let me say this, if they are rude, click, hang up the phone. Please do not speak with beings like, you know something, if I called up any one of you and I said, you're an idiot, how can you make such a mistake? Click, you would hang up on me. No, not acceptable. Not acceptable to um, be insulting or to give information in a way that is not loving and helpful. So another example that I give is sometimes there are these hyperspace beings that love to see you fail. Kind of like if you're a gymnast and you're about to do a tumbling routine and someone you know shouts something from the audience and then you tumble off course and whatever there are beings who love to do that to you so as soon as like you're trying to play the piano or trying to paint something perfectly or trying to do a yoga pose those beings love to try to push you over or screw you up or jog your elbow so that you make a mistake or whatever and those beings they're clearly not friends they clearly do not have your best interest at heart or let's say Russian judges, Russian or, or Russian coaches, Russian coaches in the gymnast world, they were famously critical and never praiseworthy. You know, they would point out all of your flaws, but not praise you for the things that you did well in your routine. I've kicked out all of those hyperspace beings. I do not need anyone up there who's going to celebrate my failures like Schadenfreude, you know, like they're going to be so happy when I fail, or anyone who's going to oh so helpfully point out an extremely long laundry list of my flaws don't need it don't want it don't desire it and you can tell by my voice like i have had it in this moment i've had it with beings who want to reach across thousands or millions or billions of miles of interstellar space in order to talk to my mind and they want to put bs into my mind like that like if they want to say anything that is demeaning anything that diminishes you anybody if you have a hope or a dream like if it's like I want to fly to the moon, or I want to write a sonata, or I want to learn how to surf. Anybody who diminishes your dreams, do not interact with them. So if any hyperspace being was like, that can't happen, or that would never happen, or you don't have the wherewithal to make that happen, again, I would not interact with them. The same exact um, standards that I hold my physical friends to, I hold my non-physical friends to. And because of this, I have gotten rid of a lot of non-physical friends because there's a lot of entities that would love to communicate to and through a corporeal form. They're out there, they're waiting. They love to talk to us because a lot of people here don't appreciate what they've got in terms of creative capacity and being powerful in the physical realm. These other non-physical beings would love to take advantage of you. But I also say this, like you can't just hop into my body for your own convenience, say what you want to say and then hop out. You don't get it. And, and I have educated many hyperspace beings on this. On the care and feeding of Aurora. You know something? Bodies have to live in a house. Bodies have to be clothed. Bodies need food. Bodies need all sorts of physical resources. And I do not want any of you, nor do I myself, intend to be in an unequal relationship where a hyperspace being wants to use my body but doesn't want to actually pay for it. So I'm finishing up the recording of what's going on in the back and then I'm opening the floor up to questions. Um, that you should not allow, I, I do not want anyone to be exploited, just like I myself do not wish to be exploited. So the best way to exploit someone is to first of all tell them that they're worth nothing or that what they have isn't special and valuable and that they should sell it to you for cheap. You know, this is the first, 
how to exploit humans 101. Tell them that they're nothing and that they know nothing and that they need you for everything. Like there's a lot of programming in that. The whole idea of like having to be saved by someone external. Having an external messiah. Even if you yourself do not believe in that, being submerged in the, the Judeo-Christian culture gives a lot of that programming. And sometimes it's subtle. It can come out in things like fairy tales, like the idea like being saved by Prince Charming or being saved by Jesus or being saved by whomever. And you might think this sounds ridiculous, but look to some of the current fantasies that are going on. The idea of extraterrestrials coming down and saving us. And I said coming down, quote unquote, like silver flying saucers coming down and quote unquote saving humanity. Or I was speaking with Mike about this, the idea of Nessara, the mythical fabled Nessara funds that were meant to be released secretly, of course, to each individual in order to sustain good people you know during this planetary transition these are all like mythical like ah oh, when i get rescued when my ship comes in i do not feel that they are effective and i don't embrace those ideas because they are personally disempowering if i were cast away on a desert island like tom hanks in that movie i would not be waiting for someone else to come and rescue me i would build a boat out of coconuts or whatever materials i had at my disposal and i would attempt to rescue myself this is our situation here in this third dimensional realm we do live in a prison we live in a mental prison Please do not expect someone else, like a hyperspace being, to come down from the sky and hand you the key and say, here, you're free now, other than me, of course, giving you the flying rainbow lasagna. But, you know, please do not expect a person who comes in a clank, clank, metal, a metallic spaceship. This is the cultural programming. So we need to understand a couple of things. We are responsible for our own experiences. That higher dimensional self is us, just moving at a vastly different rate, and that we desire to have a partnership of equals where the perspective and exalted information from, uh, of beings that live in a hyperspace realm is combined with the passion and emotional juiciness and capacity to manifest creatively of beings that are on the ground in the physical realm. It should be both. It should be like, like I'm a classically trained pianist who can also totally improvise and jam out and play John Coltrane or play rock and roll or play blues and also play Mozart note for note perfection. This is what we are all becoming. Like we won't live in that same old world that is a, separ a false separation. The lower self, like the fleshy organic ego self and the higher self, we are coming together into a flying rainbow lasagna realm, which is going to be the partnership and seamless integration of both of these selves. So just like I was telling you on another occasion about dolphins sleeping, one of their hemispheres going to sleep and then the other hemisphere going to sleep and alternating in that way and having this more dreamlike but integrated consciousness with their, waking, their daily waking consciousness, we are all going to have the experience of integrating our chakras, our non-physical energy centers that are made of pure timelines and that know, um, you know, have the exalted perspective with our physical, temporal selves. And this will be expansive, empowering. As an artist, it's like getting new colors in your paint box. If you were an athlete, it would be like, um, being able to double your performance, like not just run 26 miles, run 52 miles if you want to. Um, amazing things will happen. And like uh, if you're ever in a marriage or like a physical love relationship, it's very challenging. It's very challenging and you have to work through it. Like there's difficulties and things that don't mesh or don't fit together. And you have to somehow through love communicate and work it out and, uh, figure out a way to happily coexist. So I definitely would like to open up the floor to any comments or questions about what's going on.
And it's okay if you don't have any particular questions or anything that you need to share. Questions about Christ consciousness are good because there's a lot to talk about with that. Question is, is the Christ consciousness both male and female energy? The answer is yes, or it is a divine or a neutral type of energy that is comprised of both of those. Just like white light is comprised of all of the colors of the rainbow added up together, Christ consciousness is comprised of all of the genders, everybody's viewpoint added up together. So that's a pretty important understanding because we've also we've been heavily programmed to expect Christ to be a man and Christ to be a man with a beard who's going to come from the sky and save us. We really need to integrate and understand that Christ is within all of us and that Christ consciousness is not necessarily male. Not to expect saviorship, but if you did expect saviorship to be able to embrace a female or a balanced what we really are doing when we are embracing Christ consciousness within is embracing whatever is the opposite gender. And eventually each one of us will be a in entirety. You will be both salt and pepper. You won't be just either salt or pepper. You'll be them both together because this is, this is unity. This is the first step in returning to unity consciousness with everyone together. Got it. Sorry, I missed that comment, Noel. I'm going to read Noel's question from before. I have been on a limited refined carbohydrate diet for about 10 days, and I have noticed that I feel lighter, clearer, less irritable, and more connected. Can you help us understand why refined carbohydrates taste so good and at the same time are so bad for us? That's a beautiful question. Thank you so much. Okay, so carbohydrates do have a similar effect on the biology of the body to certain addictive substances like cocaine. It has a stimulative effect and it stimulates certain pleasure centers or the sense of satisfaction. This is very molecular, this is very science-based because it just has to do with certain substances um, pushing the right buttons in your neurology. And even if those substances aren't healthful or beneficial to eat, they press the right buttons. And so your brain is like, ah, oh, I like that. I need that pasta. Pasta is good. So in, in the natural world, if we were eating like, you know, people talk about the paleo diet or eating, you know, um, a much the way that people would eat in a less sophisticated realm where there were not the same capacities for food um, processing, um, the capacity to get carbohydrates was like far diminished. People did not have that many carbohydrates in their diet because they were harder to find. Like, you know, like, of course there's green and leafy vegetables, but until agriculture came along, things that were starchy and sugary were rare and hard to find. And if you think about it, like if you think about, um, I just have to shift the chair here. If you think about fruit, you know, fruit is only in season for a very short amount of time, unless you live someplace beautiful like Northern California. But most places, fruit is only available at the end of the summer. And there aren't that many other things that are like pure sweetness. You know, there's honey. But I'm trying to say that the body developed these certain you know pleasure buttons in response to its environment a very long time ago and in the past hundred years people have created a food supply that is totally different in its availability than what was available when the neurology and biology was developing and being programmed so there's all of these buttons, it's like kind of like why people also really like fatty, salty stuff. Like some people crave carbs, some people crave fatty, salty, like, you know, fried chicken or like potato chips or something like that. And the desire for fat has to do with the desire for extremely concentrated calories. And this is because like bodies used to be a lot more physically active. You, in order to survive, it used to require a lot more running around, hither, thither, and yon than it does now. Now we sit in front of the computer and we talk to each other, but it, things were very different. And just being able to get enough calories to subsist was a challenge. So the bodies were programmed to crave these 
highly concentrated sources of nutrients because they were hard to find. Like even nuts, fatty nuts and stuff like that were hard to find. You would only get those in, you know, like September, October at the end of the season. So basically because we as animals are no longer living in perfect divine harmony with the planet. If we were, we would eat what is available and what's in season. Like we would eat dandelion greens when they first come out in springtime because that's when your liver needs cleansing. And we would eat sweetness and fruity things at the end of the summer because we'd all be very active running around in the warm weather and the long days. And then we would all eat starchy root vegetables in November to put on, ex put on some extra weight for the winter so we could get through the winter. But of course, our lives are different now because we have artificial light, artificial heat, food that comes from all over the whole entire world. Like we don't eat seasonally and locally anymore because we have jet planes that can bring us tomatoes from Israel at any time. So um, our bodies, like the, I want to say wiring, like the patterns of what our bodies are supposed to want are often at odds with what we really need. So, okay, in my own experience of being here and, and ingesting food in the human realm, I used to not know about food. I didn't know about its molecular structure or what was quote unquote healthy or unhealthy. I just ate according to taste and what it did to my body. And I had to learn like, wow, some of these things that I'm eating really, even though they taste good, are not having a positive effect on my body. And my journey, it came more through the challenge of having seizures and the neurological disruptions, but I basically had to educate myself and learn that there's a connection between carbohydrates and um, excessive neural activity and seizures, so that it was not something that was good for my body to eat. But I, I don't tell everybody else, like, don't eat this or don't eat that because there's bio individuality and so that might be the right thing for you. But um, I will tell you that I, don't personally ingest um, things like refined sugars, like I'll eat honey, but I don't really eat that much bread either. And that's more of a self-preservation thing because I think a lot of the grains here in this time and place have been genetically modified and that they would once have been digestible, like whole wheat bread from a hundred years ago, I'm sure was very digestible and wonderful, but I'm extremely um, uh, skeptical about the wheat and corn and everything that comes from it here in this time and place that it feels like foreign organisms that are not capable of being digested by your actual intestines and you might be better off just not putting them in there at all. And my experience in the past three years since Fukushima is that it is difficult to find any food substance that is safe and healthy to ingest. People don't know how extensive the poisoning of our environment is, and I don't tell you this in order to reduce your enjoyment of food, but just to have people be aware that it is very difficult in this time and place to find things that aren't inedible due to radiation. Doesn't mean they're not on the menu. They're still in stores, in restaurants, and on supermarket shelves. You can still buy all this irradiated stuff, but you don't want to actually eat it. And in the end, there's like a separation of like, okay, who was smart enough to know, like, don't eat the oysters anymore. Like, you know, don't eat that stuff out of the ocean anymore. And people who are still like, oh yeah, you have my tuna salad every Monday morning, you know, like, like no, don't, don't eat tuna anymore. Not only because it's an endangered species, but really it is not um, safe because it is filled with cesium-137 and that is not a good substance to eat. So I, that was a very long answer, but I hope that that spoke to what, what the question was about. Uh, absolutely, happy to do it. More questions, comments, or issues, uh, divine co-creative partnership, or anything else, um, you know, you can always, um, if you need uh, guidance or have questions about other aspects of consciousness, now is a good time. And I'll also offer myself up for um, Skype meetings and personal emails. Like if, uh, I've have had students who have um, topics that they do not want to share with the entire world, if it is health issues or personal financial issues or whatever, and that you certainly can get in touch with me uh, in confidence and in privacy. And I, I'm happy to give you my best perspective of a walk-in. That is all that I have to share is my authentic perspective. And I'm not sure if I missed another comment down here. 
Okay. So, not sure if anything else needs to be said or done. Well, to check out next week, we will be doing lesson 16. Lesson 16, let me just scroll through and see what we've got here. Lesson 16 is all about the death journey. This is good because I've been speaking about ascension and I've been speaking about divine co-creative partnership and now we're really getting to changing and editing your basic programming. Basic programming is you're born, you will age, become decrepit and die. Want to remove that program? Ah, okay. Noel says, had an insight or remembering earlier this week that I am the source and I have often sought guidance outside of myself. I received a message that I should be looking within instead of looking without. I absolutely endorse that and it's more important now than ever before because there's a lot of information like you know through YouTube, through Google, through everything it's pretty amazing that on the computer we have access to so much information, but it's more crucial than ever that you deploy your inner skeptic in absorbing information. And that just means that each person has an ego and some amount of distortion. So if they are bringing messages from beyond, if they call themselves a channeler, a healer, a prophet, or just a person flapping their mouth parts, it must be understood that that's information coming through their particular filter and that first of all you are a equal to any channeler prophet or perceiver of divine insight like there is a value because someone else asked me they were like they themselves do readings and i said oh why don't you have so and so do a reading for you and they said i don't need a reading i give readings but guess what doctors still sometimes have to go to the doctor sometimes a doctor might have a pain on their back that they cannot treat or perceive themselves and then you need someone else to be able to help you and this is also part of divine co-creative partnership that we have split ourselves off into these many many rays of individuality and we are down here in order to teach each other and help each other and learn and grow certainly i see more more typing is happening okay noel says a doctor who treats himself has a fool for a patient, like a lawyer who represents themselves has a fool for a patient too, seriously. Um, from Lucy over on the MacBook, she asks, is it okay to connect in bed and then fall asleep in the process or does one need to sit up? It's totally okay. You're talking about connecting to your higher consciousness or your, your, gu your guides and yourself, I presume. Yes, absolutely. There is no formula that says you must be sitting in the lotus position with your hands like this, nothing at all. Um, if you don't want to fall asleep, it's effective to, to meditate sitting up in a chair. But if you do want to transition into sleep, totally like I would even say, make your bed as comfy as possible. Um, burn sage or whatever essential oil creates for you a beautiful um, aromatic realm. Like if you like rose oil, rose oil is fine. If you like what, whatever it is, but people don't necessarily understand the power of smells to create a, a realm, to create a world. And what I'm in, encouraging you to do is to create a bubble, like a, a bubble for traveling and for safety that is your energy bubble, your safe, um, special, comfortable place that you can fully relax inside of and that you can be receptive to those loving, benevolent energies that you can envision this bubble or like a Merkaba only allowing in energy that is unconditional love and higher and keeping out any other presences that would be distortive or not what you want. Yes. Okay. And then, um, I do not have a problem with the crossing of, uh, so the question is in meditation, is it okay to cross your arms or feet? I sometimes do, like I sometimes sit, you know, quote unquote Indian style or with my legs crossed, but sometimes that's not comfortable to my back and to my hips. Like we have to be kind to ourselves or, or you know, don't, don't give yourself yoga knee because you're busy trying to sit in the full lotus, like sit in a way that is comfortable. And I would say this, do an experiment. First try sitting or um, being receptive with our body parts crossed 
and then try it the opposite way and see what works for you and see what is actually really effective. All of this is trial and error. Someone else asked me about Merkaba and which direction, you know, the one, the point that is pointing out like this, which direction should that be spinning? Should that be spinning in this way, in this way? And I told them the only answer I can give is the way that I do it myself. Like I hold my paintbrush like this and this is the result that I get. But if you want to hold your paintbrush like this, that's fine. You can totally paint a whole painting just like that. Like, I'm not going to tell you what you're allowed to do, but I will give you information about the safest and most effective way to do it. And in terms of transitioning into sleep with your spirit guides, like I, you know, I'm still learning lucid dreaming. I have a lot of neurological like challenges in accessing those parts of my brain. But if you are an adept, those can be wonderful aspects of consciousness to explore. The envelope between wakefulness and sleeping is a rich territory for exploration. You can go on whole spirit journeys just in that little blink of an eye that it takes for your consciousness to go from you know this side of waking to this side of waking. And there are whole um, communities of consciousness that live there that you can interact with and meet up with. So th there's, uh, there's so many, it's like saying once you get a car, you can drive anywhere. It's like, yeah, there's a whole lot of wonderful things you can do and you must wear your seatbelt and drive safely and make sure that you call and leave a note where you're going and observe the proper safety procedures in doing any kind of traveling and exploration. Noel says, I woke up a couple of nights ago and was restless and worried about a dear friend. While still in bed, I asked the spiritual healers of the higher dimensions to help, and I received an amazing boost of assurance and resolved and easily went back to sleep. Very interesting. So I would say this, you know, when a person crosses our mind, like when you think about a person, often we have something of benefit to give to that person. You know, like you might be thinking of someone, you know their life story and they're in turmoil, and when they cross your mind, you can um, literally take that as an opportunity to send out some positive energy to them because we are all literally connected. So you were able to connect to that person through the integument of the hyperspace realm. And this is absolutely appropriate. This is what we, this is the, the um, society that we are moving towards, you know, where if you think about someone or someone crosses your mind, it is not merely a random coincidence at all. It's actually because of the interconnectedness of consciousness and events that there's a reason for it and that you might even be able to give something, be of service or receive something in these experiences. So I've definitely been noticing that more in my um, dream time world or the hyperspace um, telepathic, let's say non-physical connections, and then those connections coming out into the daily realm also. You know, like I might, if I know that someone is troubled in their life, I might speak to them in the non-physical realm and reassure them and say, hey, that's really okay. And then I might even get a phone call from that very person where I then am performing that role in the physical realm. Like I predict that we will all be experiencing much more crossover between these two realms. Okay, so I'm just going to read this before I share. So Ray is bringing up questions of um, slavery in various different social contexts and in Roman, you know, ancient times, in some ways being a slave was a valid social position. And I understand what the point that you are making, Ray, just like in this time and place, like being a gladiator was technically being a type of slave where you had to fight, you know, for survival and you didn't really have a choice. 
We are enslaved in a very similar way in this time and place in terms of wages. That people in this time and place are slaves. You can have a good slave job, you know, where you work in a cubicle under fluorescent lights and bring home your predictable paycheck at the end of each week. And it is considered to be a beneficial um, position in this realm. But really, when, I, when we characterize slavery, we should say that it has a couple of different features a lack of self-determination. One does not achieve the fruits of the efforts that one sends out. And often it is like a, that I guess would fall under the category of exploitation. So, you know, when you work, like uh, let's talk about a fast food worker who might work minimum wage, they are um, working for a very small amount of money and they are not stockholders and they are not benefiting from all of the sales or the overarching um, profitability of the company that they actually work for. They're being exploited, it's a form of slavery. But of course, me using those words in this time and place doesn't ring true to some people because they say, that's not slavery, this is capitalism, and they have made a choice, and they got that job, and it's not the same as you know losing one's self-determination. But we can also say that the slavery conditions that exist in this time and place have to do with lack of opportunities, lack of better options, and that people certainly choose to engage in what I would call slave work or put themselves in a slave position because it is survival and it is necessary for survival. I want to speak to what Lucy has written here. She says, you spoke of not battling between light and dark, yet it feels like that is what is happening on the planet at this time. Fear and darkness is being spread in the news. Well, you're absolutely right. There is a war that's been ongoing for like millennia between forces of good and forces of evil. We would say forces of awareness and forces of anti-awareness, forces of organization and forces of disruption and chaos. That is par for the course. That is not something new. But what is new is in this time and place, it is no longer appropriate to be stuck in those levels of duality because we have the flying rainbow lasagna. This shape allows us to resolve duality. So if, if you gave me the pie cutter of the universe, I would not cut the pie of the universe so that it was 100% good. And if you gave the pie cutter of the universe to someone who's evil, they probably would cut the pie of the universe so that it is 100% evil. If I had the pie cutter of the universe, I would have mostly good and most or uh, 50, more than 51% organized and non-chaotic. I would have a tiny little amount reserved for evil, for chaos, for unpredictability, for uh, lower dimensional behavior, because that is necessary. Because if you didn't have that, the closed loop of consciousness that is this system would not be able to continue indefinitely. This is why God created evil. Oh, I'm so happy that we're here tonight talking about this question. Why did God create evil? Because just like you need a tiny dash of vanilla extract in your cookies to make them taste really good, or a dash of salt is necessary in most recipes to make it taste right, dash of evil is necessary to make things work if you've ever had one of those little games that's like numbers and they're little tiles and they slide all around, if you don't have an empty space, you can't slide the tiles around. You're stuck. Tiles are all locked together. Well, if we lived in a realm that was perfectly organized, to where there was a totality of awareness, everyone knew everything and there was nothing left to explore, it would be like having that little tile game with no empty square and no way to shuffle the tiles around into a new format. We would not be able to, it's like saying you can't shuffle the cards of the universe, you can't change the genetic deck, you can never have a mutation, you can never have a new color, you can never have a new idea, you can never have a new song. Take away a lot when you take away what we would call evil. So the real issue is not that evil exists, but how much of it exists and where it exists. We don't need to get rid of it, but we do need to corral it into sensible areas, just like in your body. You know, you have poop in your body, but it's not all over your body. It is in one small, sensible area where it's supposed to be, and it does what it's supposed to be doing. Um, 
Let me just refer back to this. We're talking a little bit about the concept of slavery here. So Ray is making the point that um, slavery sets you free because it takes away from your need to make decisions. And I wholeheartedly disagree. Do not think that slavery or being taken away from your decisions um, sets you free in any way. Um, my whole gig and why I'm here is because I understand that when Ray is referring to mundane decisions, but you know something? Um, it is not like for to have someone dictate to you like like what you eat or what you wear or what you do for like there's no such thing as that setting you free anytime I'm taking away someone else's choice I'm taking away your choice I'm not giving you greater freedom and latitude I'm giving you less freedom and latitude and I do not feel that I mean it's a lot of mental pretzeling in order to have to twist my mind around to think, oh yes, yeah, slavery is setting me free. I really don't think that it is. Um, a lot of what is going on in this current time and place is about, let us say, making a bid for freedom. And instead of thinking about it as a fight, a battle between good and evil, a battle between adversaries, I like it better to say that it is a fight for freedom because that's an abstraction and in the same way that a runner doesn't necessarily need to be running against someone else, you can be running to beat your personal best or just to finish the race or to be the fastest that you've ever been able to be. This is the idea that you do not have to have an adversary in order to motivate you. So this is another aspect of duality that I am totally busting. The idea that it's necessary to have friction. It's necessary to have the push against your pull or the tight, um, you know what I'm talking about, the tug of war. It's necessary to have that. And it's actually, it's not. It's actually only necessary to have a small amount of the limiting factor or a small amount of friction. And because we have so much of that in our experience, it is not possible for us to build greater edifices of consciousness. We're involved in so much friction that it is difficult to build something that requires more openness, vulnerability, or trust, and definitely better communication. Um, not ending class, I'm just ending the recording for the moment. There we go.